Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective, part two of Calvinist struggle to reconcile how God loves the world. Now, before we continue, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comment section below all comments. So welcome. This is part two of us uh, deconstructing this defense of, and here's the thumbnail, 1 John 2, 2, and Limited Atonement. This video was put out by uh, Keith Folsky of Your Calvinist Podcast. He is both an apologist and a pastor. Now, in order to understand why he's making this argument, you have to understand Calvinism and what they believe, because why that they feel the need that they have to reconcile the two. So the first thing is that the, here's this image here of um, the world. You could say the, the people represents the total of humanity. And then as 1 John 2, 2 says, <clears throat> that Jesus um, is himself the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So this represents the whole world. Now Calvinists come along and says, uh, 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 not so fast. What we are reading on the plain reading on the plain pages is not so. So here is another view. Here is the Calvinistic view of humanity, God saving humanity, not all of them. And so Calvinists believe that God, before the foundation of the world, chose from the total humanity certain that would be saved. So at this picture here, you look at the group of people that's up on a hill closer to the cross. They are the ones that God chose for salvation before the foundation of the world. And because he chose them for salvation, Remember the term limited atonement. He, Jesus dying on the cross only atoned for those that he chose, those pictured here closer to the top of the hill. Now, if you are of the few on the bottom of the hill, the, the rest of whom God didn't choose, then you are out of luck. You, you are eternally doomed. You have no hope of salvation. God does not want to save you. He chose not to save you by reason of not choosing you. And then the worst of all is you are destined for eternal damnation. So that's kind of the Calvinist view. And that is summed up in the five points of Calvinism. That's called tulip. So the T is total depravity, meaning we're, everyone in the world is hopelessly lost in sin. The U and the U and the L are the most objectionable because here's where unconditional election means that God only chose certain from humanity and he did not choose the rest. And because he only chose certain from humanity, the limited atonement is that he only uh, Jesus only died for those whom God chose, okay? And then the I is the irresistible grace, and the P is the perseverance of the saints. Um, I find this theology not only puzzling, um, but troubling, disturbing of how they view God's gospel that he gave, the revelation that he revealed, his character, because basically they're saying, well, you ought to look. And, and as I asked the question before, I said, well, if you're in this crowd, how do you know if you are elect? Worse, how do you know if you're not elect? In other words, for the sake of this conversation, let's suppose I'm not chosen. I'm not elected. So let's just kind of suppose that. How do I know as I'm among this sea of humanity that God didn't choose me, that I will never ever know salvation, know the love of God through his son, Jesus Christ, because God didn't choose me. 
How do I know that? Okay. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Let's get back to the the video. And in part one, we covered. Um. Okay. Here we go. All right. So let me go. I'm just going to read the the scripture itself. And uh, here we go. My. So this is First John two two. Now you under kind of understand why they have to respond to that. Because if you say God didn't choose everyone, well, then why did he say it? And here we go, First uh, John 2, uh, 2 and 2, but I'm going to start at verse 1. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So now you have to, if you say that God didn't, never intended, right, to save everyone, then why is he saying it here? So in part one, we dealt with the pro, uh, Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. And um, so we went through Romans 3 to show how, again, that he says over and over again. In fact, one of the most interesting things we read that for God to have not intend to save everyone, that he repeatedly says he says he saves, he wants to save everyone. But let's look at their argument now. We're going to go back because now we're going to talk about he's going to define world. Now, we said propitiation, that Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. Now, it's kind of interesting to understand the statement in the context here that John is writing it. He says, my little children, and that's who he's talking to, don't sin. But if you sin, he says, if you sin, then Jesus is the propitiation. Now, in order to understand that, we needed to go to other passages that teach on salvation. We did that in Romans 3. So if you refer to part 1 and or Romans 3 verses 19 through 25. Okay. But now he's going to define now who's the propitiation for. It, it's almost kind of maddening to me that we have to explain this. But here is the thing. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. He goes on and says they're not for ours only. But who is the ours? Well, John and his little children. But then he goes on and says, but not for ours only. But then he goes on and says, but also for the whole world. So now we have to look at what the definition of world is, and this is where it gets even more maddening how they want to kind of, you're going to see how the, the, the method of how they want to twist this to fit the Calvinistic narrative. That's what's most troubling here. That, that's what's most troubling. Because notice he said whole world. So keep that in mind, that he is the propitiation for the whole world. All right, so let's go back. Here we go. World, on the other hand, has a series of different meanings and uses throughout the Bible, and in particularly even in John's writings. Some would say world always means every single person who has ever lived. Now, I'm going to challenge that. Who's teaching that? See, this is, again, Building a straw man. This is kind of this. This is that technique, and a, a defense technique. What's troubling here is the the to me the lack of not wanting to know what God's truth is. In other words, I don't have a denominational dog in the hunt. I simply want to know what God's word says. Uh, and that's why I said, so if I'm not chosen, how do I know that I'm not chosen? If God, you know, if God in his sovereignty did only choose certain people uh, for salvation, I couldn't do anything about it because he's God. But if he's going to take the time to reveal in his word, but then he's going to say over and over and over again that he, he wants all. He wants the world to say. Now, that's troubling when you have to now try to say that all of those 
uh, instance where it speaks that, and we're going to get into some of them, that he doesn't mean it. In other words, he's saying it, but he doesn't mean it. Another thing is, even in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, I don't speak Greek, but I haven't heard any defense, because if it was in the Greek, they certainly would say it, that in the writing structure, the Greek structure, that the phrase, the verbiage, is in the Greek. It's not. So what do they do? They're going. To, you're going to see where he's going to now add thoughts to it. So he first introduced, well, world doesn't mean world, right? All doesn't mean all. But let's challenge what he says. But that is demonstrably false in several verses. One day. Now again. No one is saying that every time the, the, the term world is used, that it means every single person, right? It, first of all, no one, no, one, no one is teaching that. So the argument here that he's making is kind of like, there's no abuse because no one believes that and no one teaches that. So for example, when it says Jesus came into the world, no one believe that that means that he came into every single person, excuse me, every single person. But this is a way of building up a straw man so you can break it down. But it also is a way of deflecting from, well, what is the plain reading? Okay. And I'm going to say this, let's say this right up front. Let's see if by his definition, are you confused of when John uses the term world? Are you confused by, what does he mean by world? of the Bible even lists 22 different and distinct nuances of the word world used in the Bible. For instance, we know that the Bible says, for God so loved the world. And then in another place, it says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. And so, so let's take a look at that. Let's examine those two verses right here, because funny, he should say that, right? But also, I think it's quite sad, but let's kind of take a look at this right here. The two verses that he used, so let's go to John's gospel, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 3. I'm, I mean, John, John's gospel, chapter 3, and just for the context right here, let's, I'm going to pick it up in verse 14. He said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, right? So, no, so he makes a statement. But God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, again, let me ask the question. Are you confused what he means by world? Now, you're only confused if... You listen to a Calvinist try to confuse you on this, which he's trying to do. But let's go on. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So right here we see two different uses of the term world. Now I'm going to jump a little ahead and explain because he's going to explain. But the term world means cosmos. And what cosmos means is the ordered system of creation. So we're talking about the universe, space and time. Then we can talk about the solar systems, the planets and their orbits. But not necessarily the planet itself, but then the systems on planet Earth, such as, but not limited to, the financial system, the religious systems, the uh, governmental systems, right? So all these different systems. And then it also means the people of the world. So at this point, are we confused with that just simple definition? Certainly we can say, for God did not send his son into the universe, that the universe to condemn the universe. So we can say, we're not, con we're not confused on that. We can certainly say that the people of the world is in view here. And then he said, but that the people of the world might be saved. Now, another thing about world, that as it is used in scripture, it will also um, mean 
the evil, sinful system that what God created became evil, sinful, and then darkness. In other words, at no time in Scripture does the term world ever refers to God's people or the church. However, when he says here, God loved the world, it becomes clear he's talking about the people of the earth. So why is he using all of the other kind of uh, iterations of the term world? Well, he's trying to, I guess, cloud the, the mindset as if maybe we're stupid enough to not know the difference. So that in verse 17, when he said God, he did not send his son into the world, right? So does he mean people here to condemn what? The world. So we know there's two different we know there's two different uh, um, meanings here. So God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, <coughs> excuse me, uh, but that the world, the people, right, might, uh, might be saved through him. How do we know that? He that believes in him is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So he, he, just by the context, would then tell us that he is referring to the world and then the conditions then that, that he sent his son into the world so that the world, he sent his son that the world can be saved. Well, why then wouldn't the world be saved? He clarified it by he who believes is not condemned, but he who does not believe is, con is condemned already. So in that sense right here, we can see that what he is referring to then is the world. All right. Now, um, let's kind of go back to, I'm going to look at one other verse of scripture here. Uh, this is John chapter one. And where do I want here? There you go. Verse 29. Now watch it say, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the what? Sin of the world. So my question is, are we confused by this? So when he says world here, are we confused if he's talking about the systems of the world, the universe? Um, you know, are we, conf are, are, we, are we confused? Are we not just by the plain reading talking about the people of the world? So the world. We can also say this, the sinful people. Why? Because he says he's here to take away the sin of the world. Now, that statement in itself becomes important because notice the sin of the world he takes away. Um, and not just, he could have said he takes away then the sin of only the chosen people in the world. Now, keep that kind of phrase in mind because they're going to use that later. But again, so we can see that with all of this here, we talk about world. Right? He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, the verse that he is talking about in, in, in 1 John 2, and uh, verse number 15, here is his comparison Do not love the world or the things in the world. Right? So, right here, we could say he's very plain about what he means do not love the world or the things in the world are we confused is god then crazy because remember you you're indicting god by saying well in one sense he said god loved the world but in the other sense he tells us here not to love the world is there confusion with this here clearly because he defined what was in the world look at um if any, notice that verse 15 again, do not love the world or the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, right? So if anyone, but well remember the anyone is a part of the world. So when he said in John 16, John himself, the writer of both books, so the world would mean anyone when he said God loves the world. Verse, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 
So again, I would ask the question, are we confused by this? Are we confused by how he's using the term world? And so we know that these are different uses of the Greek word cosmos, which is the word for world. And one of the best examples which show that the word world does not always mean every single person is in John's gospel. John chapter 12, verse 19 says this, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is referring to Jesus. The Pharisees are saying that the world was going after Jesus, but that obviously did not mean every single person because it didn't include them. It also didn't include people that had never heard of Jesus. It didn't include people in China and places like that that were alive during the time of Christ. So the world doesn't always mean every single person who ever lived. Now, I'm going to say this is kind of very, very interesting he is true, but again, he's trying to build a straw man to deflect from the simple meaning of the word. Now, he is right that it doesn't mean every single person, and you would surmise that by if you was to go, and as he had to go to quote a Pharisee. Now, he's not through with these wild il illustrations, but he quotes a Pharisee statement when he says the world is gone after him. Why would you quote a Pharisee? That's kind of the interesting thing right here. Uh, and you're quoting a Pharisee in his opinion. So you're not quoting a Pharisee as the, 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 the instruct, I mean, the, the, the definition of how world is used. For sure it's used one way. So, yeah, I mean, he says the world has gone after him. But, of course, what did he mean? Obviously, not everyone in Jerusalem had gone after him. But that's what his kind of statement is. Just like we say hyperbole, we speak in hyperbole all the time. It's almost silly that we even have to explain this. But look at verse 2 again. He says, for he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Watch this. For the whole world. So while he is true that the use of the word doesn't mean every single person, except when he qualifies it as every single person, as he does here when he says the whole world, okay? And by the way, he's not, if you notice so far, he's not telling us what the word world is meaning in 1 John 2, 2 either. He's only pointing out stuff as a deflection to say that, to deflect away from the plain reading of the text. Pastor Derek Thomas was interviewed on this subject and was asked this question. I think he gave a masterful answer. He talked about the fact that he says, I've been all over the world. I've been to Australia. I've been to Taiwan. I've been to Japan. I've been all over the world, but I've never been to China. I've been all over the world, but I've never been to Iceland or the Antarctic. So his point is uh, easy to understand. World always has a context. And if we say someone's been all over the world, that doesn't mean they've been to every single place. When the Bible talks about the world or the whole world, it doesn't always mean every single individual. Now, in, in by the way, we did a video on that particular passage that he's referring to, and they it was the same, you know, 1 John 2, 2. But it's kind of funny because, again, when he says, you know, I've been all over the world, right? Now, we know it's high pop, uh, high, high um, um, pop, uh, uh, hyperbole. But if he had said, I've been all over the entire world, right? Then he could have, it, it, it would give even more clarity. I've been all over the world, sure. I Meaning he, he, he's traveled a lot. That's our walk away. But if, he say, but if he goes out and says, I've been over the entire world, as remember John says here, not for ours only, but for the whole world, then it, then it qualifies. So what is John's meaning in 1 John 2.2? 2? Well, I believe John is referring to the fact that the first mistake, I believe, you made a statement. You said, what is the meaning? and then turn around and say, I believe. I'm not interested in your belief. 
I'm interested in the plain reading of the text. So you see all of the build up, all of the build up was for up until this point here, where he now is going to again give us an opinion. I believe. Why can't you give us the plain reading of the text? And that's the sad part because you would do anything except just really admit the plain reading of the text. There are those for whom Christ died in every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation on the earth. Jesus did not die for the Jews only. Jesus did not die for the small community of John's church at the time as, as his writing, but Jesus died as a propitiation for people all around the world. He died for the whole world in that sense. Well, where did it say that? Where did it say in that sense? What does it say that he is not, uh, verse 2, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for but from people all over the world, but from people all over the world, or for, from every from people from every tribe, uh, cultures, nations, and all that. Where does it say that here in the text? He said, "But for the whole world." So where does where if and I'm let me put it like this: uh, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a Greek scholar, I'm just a simpleton. As I'm reading this, how would I deduce? How would I conclude? that the whole world is saying what he just said. It's not. That's the problem. It's not. <laughs> he is adding these thoughts to the text that nowhere that he can demonstrate that it proves that that's what John meant when he said that. And he's doing that in favor of the narrative uh, of the Calvinist narrative. And that's sad. Now I want to challenge back the idea that Jesus died and provided a sacrifice for every single person who ever lived. This is a claim that the universal atonement advocates often make, and all one must do to prove it wrong is to show that there are those who were not included in the sacrifice, sacrificial atonement of Christ. Now before he says this, and this is, hang on, hang on for this. I'm going to go back and let's take a look here. Uh, verse 16, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his um, only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, again, nowhere does it say from all different tribes, nations, and all that. Um, but then it says, he who believes. So this now is going to clarify who who can who can benefit from this 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 love that the son gave this love that god sent into the world to to save the world he who believed in him is not condemned and he, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god okay um now um let me go back because so i want you to keep that in mind and and I've, this is going to be one, to me one of the, a wild 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 explanation here. But here we go. So in First Samuel, God makes a pronouncement, and I want you to hear this pronouncement. This is about the house of Eli, and particularly the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, the ones who were in great sin during the early chapters of the book of First Samuel. And this is what it says in 1 Samuel 3, 14. Therefore, I swear, this is God speaking, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Notice, notice what it says. It says that this, this great sin that was done, that was performed by Hophni and Phinehas, and, and by extension Eli for allowing it to happen, that this sin brought about a punishment that would not receive atonement, that would forever go without being atoned for. So my question would be, did Christ provide an atonement for Hophni and Phinehas when God said no sacrifice would ever be offered as an atonement for them? So, did so again, so he goes back to a story about 800 years before Christ with the priest, Eli, 
and his two sons. They were wicked priests. And then God makes that pronouncement. Now, here's the interesting thing here, that he wants to use this. Were there any other Old Testament figures that cannot be atoned for? How about the first generation uh, of Israel that came, uh, the first generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt, who made the golden calf, who even said, and Moses himself said this was a great sin, they made the golden calf, had this drunken orgy, this 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 despicable orgy and blasphemous acts, and then they said that the calf is what brought them out of Egypt, and they were going to have the calf lead them back to Egypt. Moses said that was a great sin. So the fact that he would say that, then under the Old Testament, what did it mean for atone? What, what, was, what did God mean for atoning? And was it only the, the, was it only the Old Testament? Did God mean, because he didn't say it, that, hit, that uh, Eli's them sin, and what, why was their sin so kind of pointed out as opposed to, and there's a whole lot of other sins in the Old Testament that equal to, and in some cases worse than just Eli. So, that, so, so then God didn't say only then, right? He didn't, he didn't say that, well, every sin like Eli's and them won't be atoned for, but only that Eli's and them sin will be atoned for. But did he mean even when my son comes, right? As John the Baptist said, he is the he takes away the sin of the whole world. Even when that happens, there they won't be included in that. This is such a stretch that it's kind of really unbelievable for him to make. Okay, Christ make an atonement for Hophni and Phineas? I would say not. And in that sense, we can say the atonement was not made for every single person who ever lived. So even if you want to say that, let's play the silly game. Even if you wanted to say that, then he only mentions Hophni and, and Phineas. He doesn't mention anybody else. So why can you conclude that he's going to um, make that since he took the time to only mention Hophni and, and Phineas? This is really a stretch here to kind of prop up uh, the, 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 the limited atonement uh, Calvinist doctrine here. Now, some might argue and say, well, that was before Christ, and therefore it's not included in the world. But we know that the sacrifice of Christ is what provided atonement both before the cross and after the cross. Everyone who's ever been saved before Jesus and after Jesus have been saved by the blood of the cross. And so we can argue that the 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 fact that the universal atonement advocate wants to say that that atonement expands to every single person and Hophni and Phineas were not included, that it's not, couldn't be a universal atonement. This leads me to my last point. If we believe in hell, we have to believe in some form of limited atonement because people are going to hell for their sins. Some people say, well, they're only going to hell because of their unbelief. Well, unbelief is a sin. Wow. Okay. I'm going to say, wow. But again, just keep this in mind. They go to hell because they haven't believed. I, <laughs> and yes, then the sins are not wiped away because of their unbelief. And by the way, the scripture is the only reason given for people going to hell. The only reason is because of unbelief. Again, this is such a stretch. And if Christ died for all their sins, did he not also die for their unbelief? And so we have to either say that the limitation or the atonement is limited in scope or it is limited in power. And That's not the only, by the way, that is not the only narrative. And ultimately, the limited atonement advocate, those on my side, those on the Calvinistic side, would say it's limited in scope. It was made for the elect, for those who would believe. But the universal atonement advocate has to say it's limited in power, because even though it was meant to save all, it doesn't have the power to save all. And that's where we have our problem with those who would argue for universal atonement. Ultimately, they have an atonement that doesn't have the power to save all that it was made for. And we believe Christ died and has the power to save all that his death was meant to save. I hope this has been a help. All right. Um, 
Well, again, that's such a stretch here because, again, uh, do you know if you're saved? That's the first part. Secondly, uh, again, you, you notice the, the last statement uh, that, again, that he corrals in that uh, you believe that uh, an atonement that can't save. What did save, it is to all who believe. So you kind of set up the straw man so you can knock it down. But at the same time, not really addressing why did he say it in the first place. All right, guys, that is my perspective. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. I'll see you next time.